Hi, and welcome back to the online summit series, Yoga Beyond Exercise, conversations to heal and lead us into the new paradigm of peace, harmony, and prosperity. My name is Julie Upton, and I'm your host. Today's guest is Swami Saradananda. Swami G is an internationally renowned yoga and meditation teacher who inspires us to want to practice. She's been teaching for over 40 years and is the author of several books, including The Power of Breath, Chakra Meditation, and Mudras for Modern Day Life. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. I call this yoga beyond exercise because people, when they think of yoga, they really just think of an hour yoga class, like putting your, your body in asanas or positions. Uh -huh. And so I just wanted to shed some light into the world about the deeper aspects because people I think are yearning, of course, uh -huh. you know, they're seeking the truth of self, whether they know it or not, mm -hmm. you know? So that's actually a good question. Like, what do you, what is your interpretation, so to speak, of what yoga is? I think it's a simple, there's a simple answer and, you know, there's sort of two, it's, an experience of absolute peace and also the techniques how you get that peace so i think all the different paths of yoga are just sort of how you get that peace sort of in if you have a different personality like maybe you're a very emotional person you know so then you could practice bhakti yoga right or maybe you're a very body-centered person. Okay, you could practice hatha yoga. Or maybe you're, you know, very interested in the mind. Then you could, you know, sort of read Patanjali's teachings. And, but I think whatever your personality, there's a um, sort of a path of yoga that you could follow. To but your goal is peace, inner peace. So I think it's by definition a spiritual practice yeah and i think that um you know people say the goal of yoga is to be healthy and i always tell students that's actually not the goal that's just sort of the side effects i mean it's not bad side effects you know because it's always good to be healthy but it's not actually the goal because i mean why do you want to be healthy well you think you would be happy if you were healthy right so really the goal is to be happy you know and why do you want to be happy well there's sort of no answer to that because everyone does you know so what would make you happy and you know that's where people think that different things will make them happy and people mistake they make a very basic mistake of confusing the trigger with the actual experience you see like say i think maybe you know just a simple thing i think if i had some chocolate i'd be happy right so if i ate chocolate like for just maybe a few minutes my mind would be really focused on eating the chocolate so because my mind is focused and still i feel happy but i mistake the the trigger the chocolate for thinking that chocolate makes me happy right whenever anyone's happy it's because their mind is focused and they don't want anything else like some people you know like to work in their gardens so they think that working in the garden makes them happy but it's because they, they're, while they're working in the garden, their mind is really focused on the gardening and they're not thinking about their problems or you know, paying their taxes or being sick or anything. You see, so you mistake the gardening for the actual experience of being peaceful. See, so I think it's a basic mistake that we make. But I think when you start practicing yoga, when you start meditating, you start to realize that it's it's the inner experience that makes you feel happy 
So how can I get that in ex experience? Because if I'm looking just for an external trigger, well, that only works for a while. I mean, like chocolate only works for a couple minutes, but if you kept eating chocolate, you wouldn't be so happy. Right? Actually, you'd have the opposite effect, right? Or even gardening, you see, you, it works for a while, but then things change. Or, you know, you think, maybe you think, oh, if I just met the right person, I'd be happy, which works for a while. But then you change, the other person changes because everything in the universe is changing all the time. See? So you start to realize that there's something internal. I think this is when you really start to do yoga, is when you realize that the happiness is within in the state of being peaceful. You know, rather than running after the things that work for a while, the triggers, you just try and have that experience of being peaceful. So, and I think right now, you know, with all the, I mean, people are really upset and, you know, frustrated right now. And I think a lot of people are really looking to yoga and looking to meditation. I mean, I know personally, since the lockdown, I've never been busier. <laughs> people are constantly contacting me and you know saying would you teach you know and um because they realize that they they have to sort of go within well a lot of people are realizing that you know so a lot of people are turning to yoga and to meditation now i think yeah well it's funny i mean i think both of us know like when <laughs> what it's like to be sequestered alone and away from you know everybody and everything and that's something that we've chosen to do <laughs> you know to go deeper within ourselves right, right and this has been like society's you know retreat mode in a way but now they're seeking the tools that you need to go into retreat uh -huh. right yeah yeah, actually, just before the lockdown began in March, I, I had just signed a contract to write a new book. So the lockdown for me, it, it was just like the way I always live when I'm writing a book. You know, I, I'm home and I, I write and I focus. I do my practice and I go out a couple of times a week and I get food. So it wasn't, it wasn't that different for me. Right? But I think for a lot of people, it was like real shock and that people really need the tools to deal with it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So this is my new book that's coming out in May. And it's, um, it's about meditation, but it's not how to meditate. It's how to get ready to meditate. Mm -hmm. Because I've noticed that um, people who think they want to meditate, don't a lot of people don't actually do it because it's too uncomfortable mm -hmm. see by you know we, we always avoid things that are uncomfortable so it's t different asanas or stretches specifically um geared to getting you to sit comfortably and that's actually the name of the book is sitting comfortably <laughs> preparing the body and mind for peaceful meditation and even once they can sit, their minds are so jumpy that they're really uncomfortable. So it also includes pranayama and lifestyle things. You know, like many people drink, you know, 10 cups of coffee a day, and then they don't understand why their minds are so jumpy. So it's just sort of making people, trying to get people aware of, things they do in their life affect their mind and their happiness, you know, and their ability to meditate on. Yeah. So it's awesome. a lot of very, you know, simple things, but it's not just designed for yogis. It's actually designed for anyone in any tradition who wants to meditate, you know, just hints how it, they could sit more comfortably.
you know, physically and mentally? Well, that's another point. You know, we talked a little bit about yoga, but what about meditation? So maybe you can talk to us about meditation. Well, I think really the goal of yoga is to be able to meditate. And even hatha yoga, you know, like nowadays hatha yoga is the simple yoga you do in the health club if you don't want to do ashtanga yoga. But really <laughs> hatha yoga means any kind of physical practice that you do is hatha yoga. And I mean, we have texts dealing with this also, like, you know, the Hatha Yoga Pradipika actually says that the goal of practicing Hatha Yoga is to be able to do Raja Yoga. So many people take the modern meaning of Raja Yoga as like Patanjali's yoga, but actually that's not what it meant at the time. You see, at the time, the goal of Raja, the word, the term Hatha Yoga meant meditation. Raja means king. So the king of yoga is meditation. So the reason you do Hatha Yoga, this was the original meaning of um, that verse in the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, is the reason you should do Hatha Yoga is so that you can meditate. Right? So I, I don't think it's yoga. Meditation is something different from yoga. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's really the goal. And I think a lot of people who do the physical practice, more and more people are realizing that meditation is sort of the next step. You know, like they, they can go so far in their physical practice, but then they really have to get in, into meditation. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I've noticed. I mean, of course, that's that's what happened for me. I mean, asana, I was taught from my teacher, you know, is the word for seat. So to be able to sit for long periods of time in meditation. So even, you know, as we're working now, we're both sitting, you know, and there's there's movement that's going to need to happen or energy will get stuck. Mm -hmm. And then that causes the mind to race and to just make assumptions and judgments and choices that maybe aren't so healthy. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think, you know, meditation is such a great, I'll just call it a tool for people to know themselves, right? As we sit and we allow all the, the thoughts and the samskaras or whatnot to come to the surface instead of being hidden in the depths of the cells in the different places. Mm -hmm. hmm. So in the book, is it gonna be for beginners all the way to advanced practitioners or is it mainly for people to understand the nature of meditation? Um, it's really, it's more a practical book. Mm -hmm. And there's actually no meditation teaching per se. And I actually say that a few times in the book is that this is designed for anyone who wants to meditate in any tradition. And there are a lot of different traditions. So, you know, get a teacher, you know, decide what practice you want to do. But this is to help you to do that, that practice. Okay. That's nice. I've never heard of a book that actually prepares the person uh -huh. for whatever tradition they want. Right. They right. feel comfortable with. Uh -huh. you know? Right. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, traditionally, people didn't have to be able to sit, you know, prepare to sit because, you know, traditionally in India, people sat cross-legged on the ground all day. So if you say, you know, just sit for an hour, well, that's easy, you see. But modern people, you know, we sit hunched over computers all day. And even if you, you know, you think you're a good yogi and you do your asanas every day for an hour, but then you go to work and you do, I always joke, it's this asana, you know, where you sit at your computer for eight hours a day 
And that's why people are becoming more and more round-shouldered. You know, people are having more and more problems with their neck. Right? Like even, I've, I've been teaching yoga now for over 40 years, and I can really see the difference in people's bodies in that time. Because 40 years ago, no one had a computer. I mean, there were no personal computers. You know, and then I could see how people started working on computers and they became more round shouldered. They and now people are having more trouble with their arms and their wrists and their hands. Mm -hmm. And even my mudra book, um, I don't know if you've seen my mudra yeah. book. Yeah. I, I don't know if you noticed, but the first chapter is all exercises to make your hands and fingers flexible enough to be able to do the mudras. Because people, they sit like this all day and they, people are losing the flexibility in their hands and fingers or else they spend hours, you know, like this. You see, so they, there's a lot of tension in the, um, in the hands. So actually, when I was writing the book, I kept saying to the publisher, this first chapter that gives exercises for the hands, I mean, from my, I think this is the most important chapter in the book. Because it really prepares modern people to be able to do these things. Right? You see, so you might be able to look at a, a nice picture of someone doing a mudra, but it, if you don't have the hand flexibility, you won't be able to do it. So modern people need um, a bit of additional preparation to be able to do a lot of these teachings, you know, a lot of these practices, you know, things that people could do 50 years ago that they can't actually do anymore. You know, just because our bodies have changed so much. That's true. And a lot of it has to do with what we put inside our bodies when we eat. I'm off of sugar. I'm off of lectins. I'm off of gluten. And all of a sudden I got more flexibility back into my hands mm -hmm. because I was having some, what seemed like arthritic, um, you know, uh, things going on. And I was very stiff and swollen. And then I just changed everything and then voila. And I do this every day, <laughs> like I do exercises. So it does, everything is interconnected. And I think, yeah, you write a lot about Ayurveda as being something um, effective and simple to use in our daily lives. Can you talk about that for a bit? I have, I've also lived a yogic lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I know, I think in keeping with like the, what we call the three gunas, you know, which are, um, you know, the quality of purity and um, passion, activity, and uh, inertia, right? So I write a lot of it, you know, I include a lot of that in my writings, right? Because I think most of us, we have our minds or they're going back between being rajasic, being very overactive and being totally lethargic or we would say tamasic. So we want to increase the sattva, the purity in the physical body and in the mind, right? You know, mm -hmm. as, I, as I was mentioning, people who drink 10 cups of coffee a day and their minds are totally jumpy, it's because the food they eat is very rajasic. You know, so if the food you eat affects the state of your mind. And I know when I've lived in ashrams and people come to the ashram, and one of the comments people make all the time is, I understand why you're vegetarian, but what's this no onions and garlic? Mm -hmm. you know, and people are really sort of shocked by this because, you know, they always say, oh, but, you know, garlic's such a good blood purifier. And it's true, garlic is a good blood purifier. But on the other hand, it makes the mind very jumpy. So 
it really depends on what is it you want to achieve in your diet. So a lot of times when I teach, I have people experiment with um, like different food items. Mm -hmm. Like, um, okay, one week, don't drink any coffee, right? And after you get over like the headache thing, you know, look at how much calmer your mind tends to be. And then at the end of the week or maybe two weeks, have a cup of coffee and notice the difference. Or even if you don't drink coffee, just have a cup and try to meditate and see how it affects your mind. Or even with garlic, don't have any garlic for a week or two. And then at the end of that time, have a nice sort of garlic Italian meal and notice how much more difficult it is to meditate. So I think it's important for people to um, sort of see this and to understand it like within their own bodies. You know, I think that the problem is that a lot of people, they think it's like a list of things you're allowed to do and not allowed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and if it's just a list, it's hard to remember everything on the list. See, like I know a lot of times people say to me, oh, are you allowed to eat eggs? And I say, well, I'm allowed to do whatever I want, <laughs> but I choose not to eat eggs because of the effect that it has on me. You see, so if I start to experiment and see the effects that things have on me, then from my first hand experience, I don't want to do it. You see, if I see the effect that garlic has on my mind and I want to meditate, well, I might either reduce or cut out garlic, right? But then I know um, once I had a really bad cold and I, 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 I sometimes go to a Chinese acupuncturist, so I phoned him up and he said, well, I know you don't like to do this, but get some green onions and ginger and boil them together and drink a glass, you know, have a cup every half hour and your cold will be gone like in a day. So I did it and my cold went away. And you know, he said, after you've gotten rid of the cold, then go back to your normal diet. So I think there are things that aren't sort of morally objectionable. You see, if he had said, get a steak and eat it, I wouldn't have done it because I consider, you know, being a vegetarian to be a moral, um, Pre, you know, I stick to for moral reasons, ethical reasons, you know, so I wouldn't eat meat or fish or eggs because of ethical reasons. However, there are other things that I don't eat because of the effect they have on my body. You see, and then if temporarily I wanted to have another effect, you see, so like if I have a cold, I might take something like onions or garlic to get rid of the cold, but then Afterwards, I can stop it and I can sort of drink a lot of water and get it out of my body. Yeah. Right? So I think it's people, important for people to not just read a list or read a book, but to start experimenting for themselves to see the effect that things have on them. And then you start to decide what it is you want to achieve and you know, maybe eliminate or add things in to your diet or your lifestyle because of the effect they have on you. Yeah, I'm with you there. It's like an adventure, always yeah. like internalizing and seeing what works and what doesn't work, you know, right. for me. Because we're all different. <laughs> uh, I think the problem, a lot of people just want to be told what to do, what's right. Mm -hmm. What should I do? What's the best thing to do? Oh. And I often say to them, well, it depends. You know, what is it you want to achieve? Or, you know, you have to decide first what you want to achieve and then experiment with different things and see what helps you to achieve that best. Mm. Okay. So I think the yoga teachings are guidelines 
and we should approach them just like a scientist goes into a laboratory you know they, a scientist doesn't just go into a laboratory and start doing something right first they have a working hypothesis so i think all the yoga teachings you know all the things you read or hear teachers tell you that's your working hypothesis but then you have to go into your laboratory which is you know this is your laboratory your own body and mind and you have to see for yourself you know what works you see so a hypothesis is that if i know this is true and that is true then if i did this i should get this result so you should approach yoga like that right if i know that um asanas have this effect and pranayama has this effect and diet has this effect if i did this and this and this i should get this effect see so then um you can see if you do it you see so i think it's important not to have blind faith which a lot of people do they just do things because someone told them to do it but I think when you deeply get into yoga, you do things because of your own personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's really radical personal responsibility. And uh -huh. I, I think that's what I love about yoga. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always on me. I'm the only one who can shift or make the the shifts or the changes and do the work to have the results as you were saying you know that i want to achieve mm -hmm. right yeah yeah i think even sometimes um even in an asana class and people will say things like oh my doctor won't let me do that and i never let them get away with that <laughs> Because I consider doctors to be, um, they're consultants. I mean, we should consult them because they've studied certain things, maybe more than we have. But then we should think about what they said. And then we have to decide for ourselves what to do with our own bodies. You see, so, you know, a lot of people, they, they just, they're like victims. The doctor told me I had to do this. I did it. And now it's his fault that I'm sick. Mm -hmm. But you have to take responsibility for your own life. Right? So I think if a student says, well, my doctor recommended that I don't do that, so I'd prefer not to do it. Well, that's fine. Because then you're taking responsibility. Right? Not just saying, oh, he won't let me do it. Or actually worse than the doctor won't let me my husband won't let me do this. Mm -hmm. You see? So then you're not taking responsibility for yourself. But unfortunately, you hear it all the time in class, things like that. And how do you, how do you work with people when they say these things? Well, I just, you know, I sort of stop and I say, but you know, it's your body, it's your life. You know, you have to take responsibility for it. You see, so don't be a victim where you blame, you know, blame something, someone else for anything that goes wrong. You know, it's important to take responsibility. And I know some people don't like my classes because of that. But, um, I just think it's important to say. Yeah, I do too. I think that we have kind of grown into a species, well, certainly in the West, where we don't want to take personal responsibility. We're just constantly playing the victim card. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who's dedicated her life to not, to the opposite of that, to this radical personal responsibility, and have seen the fruits of it, I, I, I'm constantly encouraging, and, and it is off-putting for people who aren't ready 
to, you know, take responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, but I can see it, it's, it's gotten even worse. I've, I've seen lately. Um, a friend of mine just told me that apparently it's like, you can't, something like you can't say anything to somebody, you can't call anybody a name, like something silly like that. It's like all these weird things coming into, into play in the culture. And I don't play that game. I take personal responsibility as a woman of this earth. Mm -hmm. I don't abide by other people's laws and rules because I'm the law in my own body. Yeah, and that's what I have loved about yoga because it is such a radical, radical, uh, when you take it, you know, further than just the exercise aspect, it's radical personal responsibility. And you're kind of telling yourself that's what you want. That's why you're showing up to this class, right? Because <laughs> the Sanskrit holds a vibration of like, yeah. You want to know who you are? Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I actually like, you know, the, the philosopher Krishnamurti, he said, actually, it's the only revolution that works. Right? It's, you know, like yoga is, if you really do it deeply, it's a, it's really a revolutionary thing, you know, and can be quite dangerous to certain, in certain societies. I can see that. I mean, I, I've read many stories of the, you know, crazy yogis, and you can really see the wisdom in it because they're like doing the opposite thing that everyone else is doing mm -hmm. <laughs> as a trigger maybe somebody to say, oh, wait, wait a minute, what am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> am I giving my power away? Like, how am I doing that? Or to that effect. Yeah, I do think that yoga is revolutionary. And that, that resonates. Mm -hmm. So what kind of advices are you giving to kind of people who, there's a lot of people even yoga teachers i know a lot of yoga teachers and i see them fighting online with each other and the general public and i'm like shocked i don't know i'm not saying i'm judging like why but there's like a lot of duality like person pitted against person which is how i ended up doing this summit because i was mm -hmm. i was a bit in shock and i thought oh, okay this is what we need we need to come together and to put out some high vibrational content that addresses you know mm -hmm. what's happening in the world right now and people and and how we jump to these conclusions like somebody else's opinion is against me and somehow i need to exert my authority to like stand up. So how are you, how would you address, you know, kind of what's happening if you're even seeing it in the world? Um, no, I haven't really noticed it. Oh, that's great. Uh -huh. See, we're showing that there is, a, there is an existence out here where people are not living in this, that particular paradigm. <laughs> So um, I did read some of your stuff about Kriyas and what are some simple Kriyas and Mudras maybe that we can learn as human beings from you now that can just help with like balance out, balancing out that equilibrium in the brain and, and bringing our, you know, hearts back to center, say if the, the heart starts racing, you know, I know that there's different mudras that can help with that and different kriyas and stuff. Well, I know kriyas are more for purification, but. You know, I think kriyas are very important right now because you know, everyone's so worried about this virus. And we, you know, when we go out, we, we have to wear masks and everything. But then um, what if you did breathe it in? Well, you could do kriyas to clean your body before it gets a chance to attack you. So, you know, for instance, I think that especially during this, um, you know, 
with this virus, people should be doing neti every day. You know, neti is, well, I know you know, but maybe some of the people watching this don't know what neti is. It's, it's the nasal cleansing. And it, it's such a simple thing. And I think it could be like so helpful. Um, and the other thing is oil pulling. Yeah. You know, which is more an Ayurvedic technique. But these two practices, I find, I think everyone should be doing them now because they help to clean this whole, the mouth and the nose area. So um, even if we did pick something up, we could get, you know, get it out of our bodies before it actually gets into the body itself, right? So like I do oil pulling every morning, I just take some sesame oil, like a nice big spoonful, and I put it in my mouth and I sort of, um, you know, squish it around and I do it for about 20 minutes. And when I say that people think, oh wow, I don't have 20 minutes, but you can be doing other things. You know, like you get up in the morning, you put some oil in your mouth and then there are things you have to do in the morning. You know, you make your bed and you get breakfast ready. You know, you, you, know, you lay out your things for doing your practice, right? And then you spit it out, and then um, then you do neti. So you clean the mouth and you clean the nasal passages, and then I think also to do kapala body, mm -hmm. you know, the breathing exercise. I think if you did these three things every day, you've got a much greater chance of staying healthy. So. I would suggest these three things. Yeah, those are those are great things. I do the oil pulling, uh -huh. and the kapalabhati. But yeah, I think focusing on the immune system and just the way that we naturally have access to good health uh -huh. is the most important piece. You know, again, depending on medicines and you know people's opinions, consultants you know, is one thing, but like taking responsibility for your body. And all those things are so, you know, I think you get a neti pot, which is fairly inexpensive, like $15, and then oil. And it's like so easy. I usually use coconut oil. I heard you say that sesame oil, and I'm going to try that now. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's so easy. Once you get used to it, I after like a week, you know, the swishing, it just becomes second nature. You don't even think about it anymore. Uh -huh. right, right. You see, coconut oil is cooling, has a cooling property. And that's why in India, like they only use coconut oil on their head. You know, like the women put it in their hair because, well, it makes your hair beautiful. But um, the reason they do it actually, it's a hot climate. So you want to stay cool. So coconut oil has the property of cooling. Whereas sesame oil has the property of heating. Sesame has a heating property. So you want to heat to, you know, so it's more cleansing. It's like you're burning away the impurities in a way. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's a good point. So in India, they, they use sesame oil for oil pulling, whereas coconut oil, they, they, don't, they only use on their hair. They don't use it for massages or anything else. Right? All that is sesame oil. Yeah. I knew they used the sesame oil for the massages. They used sesame oil for a lot and mustard oil. Um, yeah. Well, they use mustard oil in the north and sesame in the south. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, but mustard oil is very heating. Yes. Yes, very heating. I would not want to put that in my mouth. <laughs> The, uh, in Nepal, the women put the mustard oil in their hair. Uh -huh. And you can get it in the market for just like a dollar, like a big thing of it. It's crazy. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, I didn't think about it. I just had access to the coconut oil. That's why uh -huh. I, I started doing it when I lived in India. Uh -huh. Yeah, because in North India, they cook with uh, mustard oil in the North. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the South, they actually cook with either sesame or coconut. Yeah, in Kerala, they only cook with coconut oil. 
Mm-hmm. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, because actually co- the name Kerala, it means coconut land. That's the n- literal translation of the name Kerala. Mm-hmm. Cool. Right? And when you go there, it's just coconut trees all over every place. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then for just some quick meditation techniques for people, because there are people I know of that have been meditating for 30 years and, you know, they don't get any what people would say realizations. And then people are just starting out and they're eager for something like a Kundalini awakening or something like that. Mm -hmm. So maybe just give a few words about meditation and the goals of meditation. I know we talked about it a little bit, but you know, what people, why we're meditating, you know? Well, I think why we're meditating is because we want to be peaceful. We want to be happy. Um, You know, and it's like, it's tuning to that inner peace. I think it's when you start to realize that there's no thing outside of yourself that's going to make you happy. I think it's like a big step in, um, you know, sort of changing your whole attitude towards life. You know, because most people have this attitude as, well, there's something that's going to make me happy, but I just haven't found it yet. Yeah, I haven't found the thing that works. So we're running all over the place looking for the thing that's going to make us happy, right? And I think a per, another person in, in the sense is a thing, an object, right? And then at some point we start to realize that happiness is from inner peace, right? From subject rather than object. And that's like a big change in our perspective and that's i think that's when people really get into meditation yeah and i think if you you think you're going to instantly be happiest you know people think well you know this meditation is you know people think it's so great so i'm just going to sit and i should be instantly blissful and a lot of people find they actually get the opposite result because they're holding so much impurity inside of themselves. And I'm not talking about physically. I mean, we all have anger and greed and jealousy, and we hold on to that. And, you know, whenever we feel, even nice people, you know, if you're a nice person, every time you get angry, you, you just push it down. See, and then when you sit to meditate, all those things you've been pushing down for years start to come up. So I think you have to sit in meditation realizing that you're not going to be blissful immediately. Right? Maybe some days you'll be very blissful and some days you might feel very angry. And it's just the anger that's coming up. See, and we identify with the anger. I mean, it's even in our language. You say, I am angry. You see, so you're saying that's who I am. I'm angry. I'm an angry person. Whereas in Sanskrit, you don't, you say, I go into the anger. You see, if you can go into something, it means you also can choose not to go into it. So it's built into the language, that choice. Whereas because we think in English, we identify with the negative emotions. You know, we say that I'm angry or I'm afraid or even I'm hungry. You know, we identify with our thoughts and feelings. See, so I think it's important to start to see your thoughts as something separate from your true self and to just let these things like bubble up and not to hold on to them. You know, if you get a thought that you're angry, you, 
you feel angry, you don't have to go out and punch people, right? You just see it as a thought that's coming up and you can say, oh yeah, look, that's interesting. It's like a, a bubble in a way, you see? And you just watch it and eventually it's going to just sort of float away or pop. See, So I think it's important for people when they sit to meditate is not to identify with any negative thought that comes up. Just let it go. And then choose a point of focus. And it can be really simple, like the breath. You know, like when I'm teaching uh, meditation, I always start people with the breath because everyone's got one. <laughs> they all know where it is. You know, it's not too weird. You know, like if you start people on a mantra, that's a little weird for some people. So just start very simply, you know, start with the breath and just keep, keep that awareness. Maybe throughout the day, try and keep that awareness. I think that's a very simple thing that people can do and, you know, feel more peaceful from it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think if you really want to get into meditation, at some point you have to let go of your breath also, because your breath is in your physical body. So usually when I'm teaching, I start people on the breath, and then if they, they sort of keep with it, then I introduce them to mantras. Because sound is the easiest thing for people to hold on to. Your mind holds on to sound more than it does any of our other senses. Hmm. Yeah. I, I always that. give the example, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, everyone knows the song Yellow Submarine. Hope so. <laughs> everyone in the world knows this song, I found, right? Everyone that I've met. And when I say it in class, as soon as I say, you know, the yellow submarine, everyone smiles. And immediately they can hear the song in their mind. Even if they haven't heard the song in 20 years, you can still hear the Beatles singing that song in your mind. Whereas you can't actually remember the face of a person that you saw this morning as clearly. Mm. So sound is the one sense that we can f sort of ho hold on to most clearly, most easily for most people, right? So I think a mantra is a really good next step for people. You know, start with the breath and then as you get more into it, then move on to sound. Mm. I like sound. I'm a big mantra person. <laughs> yeah. Because it's also a key to like how things manifest, you know, through waves. Mm -hmm. You know, so it, I can feel it in my in my system. Uh -huh. Even with the language, it's a vibration. We can uh -huh. we can feel it, right? So say thing in one way and it feels really good say it in another and it doesn't feel as good so yeah it's such an interesting life that we have in these in these bodies <laughs> mm -hmm. is there anything else that you want to share before we sign off talk about your books and your new book coming out and yeah well um should i show my books or sure, absolutely because oh, I have, I have, a, this was, I wrote this book, Chakra Meditation. And um, I also wrote this book called The Essential Guide to Chakras. And people always think it's just a repackaging because publishers do that all the time. They just take a book and put a different cover on. But it's actually not. You see, so this is about meditation. Mm -hmm. And this is more practical. Okay. Right, you know, how it applies to daily life. And after I wrote these two books, um, my publisher asked me to do a book on the breath. So I wrote this book, The Power of Breath. And as I was writing it, I realized that it's actually a prequel to the 
chakra work. If you want to work with chakras, you know, chakras are a hot topic nowadays. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to work with chakras. If you want to work with chakras, I think start by working with the breath. Right? And then I wrote this book called The Cleansing Power of Yoga, which I realized is a prequel to working with the breath. <laughs> So I think this is the most, it's the simplest and most important thing to do is start by cleansing, then working with the breath. And then, you know, other, there are so many other practices you can do. Um, and then, of course, I wrote this book called The Mudras for Modern Life. Mm -hmm. Incredible artwork, by the way, on some of those books. It's amazing, gorgeous. Yeah, so we purposely use the same artist mm -hmm. so that they would look like a set. And now I'm trying to get the publisher to reissue them as sort of a box set. Mm, that's that's good. Mm -hmm. idea. Well, you know, before we go off, um, maybe you could address chakras because that is such a hot topic. It's something that you see out in the world on every Instagram page and, you know, websites and everybody's got the chakras in there. But could you just say from your yogic standpoint a little bit about chakras? Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think people have to sort of understand what is prana you know, as a subtle energy that moves through your body. You know, like if you went to an acupuncturist and, you know, talks to you about your chi or your ki, what they're doing is they're working with prana. See, so acupuncturists work with prana, shiatsu people work with prana, you know, but shiatsu people, you know, they put pressure on different points because the, the prana is moving through channels they call meridians, but yogis call them nadis. Mm -hmm. and, and when, instead of you, using pressure with the hands, we use asanas to affect the flow of the prana through the nadis. See? So hatha yoga is really not just working with the physical body, it's actually working with the prana. You know, we say there's 72,000 nadis or channels that the prana is moving through. It's a network. So a network has points where th two or more um, threads cross. You know, so there are simple threads. You know, like say you go to an acupuncturist and he sticks a needle here. Probably two or more meridians cross there and it can relieve some problem. But there are also points where many major nadis, major meridians come together. And these we call chakras. Mm -hmm. So I would say they're um, multi-dimensional energy centers where the major meridians or the major nadis come together. Um, you know, and of course, there can be blockages. So you want to release the blockages, but you don't want to just, you know, people are always saying, oh, I want to open my chakras. Well, you want to have them open sometime, but you also want to be able to close them, right? You want to have your energy open, like, like now maybe we're sitting and we're talking and you're, you know, or with friends, with family, you want to be in a very loving environment and you want to be very open. But what about um, if you got on a commuter train during rush hour or in a train station, you know, where there are a lot of people around or even on the street, you don't want to be picking up everyone's energy on the street. So you also want to be able to close the chakras and not pick up energy when you choose to not pick it up. See, so I think working with the chakras is not just about opening everything up. It's about being balanced, being able to be open when you need to, but also being able to sort of protect yourself from picking up too much energy when you need to do that. 
you know, I think there are people that are too open. You know, you know, maybe they have different psychological problems that can really be related to their being like too open, not able to close down when they need to. You see, so we should be able to be open sometimes and also protect ourselves sometimes. Right, so you know that image in um, yoga tradition of each of the chakras being like a lotus flower, right? So a, lotus, a flower opens to the sun, but at night it closes to protect itself and to sleep. So we should be able to do that. I think that's the important thing of working with the chakras. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that with them. Uh -huh. So people can get in touch with you through your website and your books are being sold on Amazon. Yes. And uh -huh. I, I think you're a wonderful example of a human being on this planet right now. And I'm grateful <laughs> for your wisdom and your practice, really, um, because uh -huh. you're taking responsibility for yourself. Okay, so thank you for inviting me to be part of this. And um, I'm very happy to meet you and to be able to have this chat. Me too, me too, thank you.